that that um, Gordy was going to drop in on us. Hello there. <laughs> so he's the new NMRA president. And we also have Rick Coble, who is the new vice president. So that's pretty exciting. Um, there are two other elections that were held as well. Uh, the North American director at large was John Dohring, and the Pacific director is Bob Peterson. So we have a new group of people to work with, which is really exciting. Um, Perry, do you want to talk about your training camps? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, the training camps for the remainder of this year have been scheduled. They are already posted with their descriptions on the Piedmont Division website. In May, we'll be weathering with both um, Pam Pastels, which we have done before, but we are now adding um, washes to that as, and, and washes especially around truck side frames and underbodies and things like that where it makes a huge difference. Um, in in um, July, we're doing um, working with um, a, a craftsman, a wooden craftsman kit. We did that clinic two years ago and it sold out and I would like to avoid selling out again. So this one will also be virtual and we wouldn't we won't run out of spaces. There's information about that on the Piedmont Division website. So please register for both of those ones if you're interested. And the one towards the end of the year will feature working with scenery again. We got started on that process with the module building clinic um, training camp that we started last year. Um, and we will continue with that um, at the end of this year in person so we can get our hands dirty together and and make a mess someplace and that should be fun so those will be the three training camps this year okay that sounds great um hank do you want to talk about the train show let me go find him and yeah he's muted yep unmute him there i send a request so, Hank, unmute yourself now. Oh, I just did. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, the train show is moving along. You know it. Well, may or, may or not know, it's going to be October 2nd and 3rd. Um, this is not a contingent one. This is one that we're looking forward to move forward with. Um, we believe that the health of the nation will be such that we can make it happen. Uh, we will have layouts from g scale s scale o scale ho and n scale so we'll good, have a lot of, we'll have a lot of layouts there that will be interesting uh, tell all your friends hope to see you all there any questions Don't worry, I'll be back to you in July and August looking for volunteers. So you can <laughs> save your questions till then. <laughs> for sure. Charlie Mason, would you like to talk about the model contest? And I sent Charlie an unmute request. Okay. Right. Uh, we are having our uh, Piedmont Division model contest this Saturday. It will be held at uh, Blue Ox Trains in Roswell. If the weather is cooperative, it'll be out in the parking lot. If it's inclement, it will be inside up on the second floor at Blue Ox. Uh, this will be a drive up model contest. Uh, you can bring your models to us anytime between 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. We will have a team of five MMRs that will be judging the models. And uh, we hope that a lot of you are working on your models. Uh, I just have a couple of uh, requirements or and some suggestions. Uh, each model must be accompanied by a contest entry form number uh, nine 
901 or 901 and a judge's scoring sheet number 902. These forms are available on the NMRA website, so download them. Be sure to fill in all of the information. Now, if you're really looking for a merit award, make sure that on the judge's scoring sheet that you go through and tell us what you have done with your model. Uh, there are five different categories that we judge your models on. We use the uh, guidelines from the NMRA. The NMRA publishes uh, on their website a matrix for each of the uh, categories where they uh, give points uh, based on the quality of workmanship and the complexity. So we do our judging using those matrices. Uh, if you've never looked at what they are, look at them and you'll see how we do our judging. The other thing, it's important for you to tell us what you've done with your model. And under conformity, we're looking for uh, plans. Did you build your model using plans? Did you draw them? If so, bring them. Or bring photographs of uh, a prototype or something that's close to what you've modeled. Uh, these are how you get points for conformity. You don't want to sacrifice points just because you say, well, the judges know what a Santa Fe boxcar looks like. Well, we might not know what a Santa Fe boxcar looks like. Uh, anyway, uh, I hope to see everybody Saturday, 11 o'clock to 3 o'clock at Blue Ox Trains. And thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Okay, Dave, are you ready to do your clinic? I guess I'm as ready as I'll ever be. <laughs> okay. I want to thank you for coming and doing another one for us. That's very nice of you. Well, these are these have become fun. Um, I have to credit, again, I have to credit Gordy and a couple of the guys who threw an elbow at, actually Perry, too, who kind of elbowed me in the ribs and said, you can do this. Yeah. And I started doing it for NMRAX, and now it's becoming almost a second hobby. In its own in its own self. Wow, so. that's neat. So you're going to talk about um, modeling in ethanol industries. Yeah, so we're going to talk about the ethanol industry. You're going to get to, as is typical with me, you're going to get to hear a lot more about how it works because I'm a geek, and probably the worst geek in the world. Plus, I'm an educator, so I try to let people know why things are the way they are and why they work the way they do. So. And because lately I've been working a lot with STEM education, you're going to get to see some stuff, some video that's canted a little bit towards the high school, junior high crowd. Trust me, it's very, very appropriate for what we're going to do. So let me see if I can remember how to share. <laughs> this, the PowerPoint that I'm going to share is right there. Okay, I'm going to say that's up. Against the go. grain, it is. There we go. We'll go full screen with that. That's even All better. Right. I bring I bring this up because literally ethanol and methanol and all kinds of different alcohols have been around forever. I suspect they were distilling, learned to distill alcohol right after probably the dawn of time. Somebody was figuring it out. Um, but since we've kind of kind of grown a little bit, we've discovered new ways of using the product. And even though I live in Wisconsin, which is the state that probably distills more things, more ways for more purposes than any other state in the, in the, in the United States, um, we still find new ways to do different things here. And because I'm interested in grain modeling, uh, I got excited about covered hoppers when I was growing up because that's what I saw on the, when I lived in Iowa on the Illinois Central. Um, it kind of fell into grain elevators and then it was grain mills and over time it's gotten into different things. So this has become almost a six clinic project of 
how grain moves and moves around the railroads and such. And I always say it starts with a seed because nothing starts in this country in a lot of cases without some sort of raw material. In the, in the world of things that grow, it starts with a seed. And when we think about how, how railroads move agriculture, we're always looking at car loads. For instance, enough wheat to put 258,000 loaves of bread, enough corn for 480,000 bags of Fritos, enough soybeans for 415,000 pounds of tofu. And we'll talk about soybeans as a product that you probably don't think much about, but it's a product that goes into an awful lot of biofuel. And there are enough barley for, and I put this in for my operating group when I present, because they're always interested in the 94,000 gallons of beer. So we're gonna take a look at the seed side of it for a second. And again, it's we, it's, we have to store it, we have to mill it, we have to distill it, and then we have to get it to the end consumer. That's the thing that we're trying to do very, very hard on the railroad side of things. And we've been moving alcohol for a long time. We, you may not know the current names, Flint Hills Resources. You may, not, you may probably know Cargill. You may not know Valero, unless you've got a Valero station on your corner. But in the old days, it was A.E. Staley. And before them, Staley and after them, Staley Products and now Tate and Lyle, or ADM Archer Daniels Midland, which started originally as the Archer Milling Company up in the Twin Cities. So it isn't just today, and we've always we've always had that milling around. So let's start with our first seed here, and hopefully the audio works well. And I'm going to skip it ahead because you really don't want to see all the crazy stuff. Oil prices continue to fluctuate in industrial nation. Oh, that's me. energy dominant. Science coming on my down. Science world energy reserves. This one little kernel doesn't look like much, does it? But with the help of science and technology, I think you'll be surprised about what this kernel of corn can do in one year in all the diverse ways it affects our lives almost every day. Let's go plant some corn. Our journey begins right here by planting our one kernel in the springtime. Today's corn farmers use techniques to get more output with less input. For instance, this no-till planting we're doing means we can plant without the multi-step process of plowing, disking, and seeding the soil. Planting with low-till or no-till means not turning over and breaking apart the soil. And that reduces soil erosion and topsoil loss from wind and water. Plus, it uses less time and tractor fuel to plant. The end result is increased conservation in land, water, and energy resources. All that using half the fertilizer while also producing 68% more corn than farmers did 30 years ago. I think your grandfather would be amazed at the technology, how we now can plant without a steering wheel, uh, it's called auto steer, and it has auto shut off so that we don't plant too much corn, we don't overlap, it knows when to turn off, and it saves a lot of the inputs and waste, so we don't have near the waste that we used to have years ago when your grandfather farmed. Uh, my brothers and my philosophy is, is we're only here for a short time, and we wanna leave the land better than our grandpa left it to us, and for our children and grandchildren to, to have it better. My grandpa would be shocked by all the corn you guys are producing. Yes, that very same bushel of corn takes 30% less land today to produce than it did 30 years ago. We're able to use less fertilizer, less fuel, less water, and less crop protection products than we had in the past. So you're like checking all the environmental boxes. Well, you know, farmers are conservationists and they want to do the right thing. And this environment is extremely important to us because this is our livelihood. Next time I see a stubble field, it's never going to look the same. Well, you can rest assured you'll know why that stubble is there. It's out there protecting the topsoil. By the fall, our one kernel has grown into a corn stalk with an ear full of kernels, about 800 of them per ear. 
And once they're harvested, it's onward to where these kernels go and all the diverse ways we use them. Most of this corn, and we're talking billions of bushels, is used for livestock feed. Farmers feed it to their dairy cows, beef cattle, hogs, and chickens because it's high in carbs and protein. Of course, us humans also use it. When's the last time you ate something that used corn oil, cornstarch, corn bran, cornmeal, or corn syrup? How about pizza, soda, cornbread, corn dogs, corn flakes, graham crackers, ketchup, pop tarts, Oreos? Besides fueling animals and humans, corn also helps fuel our cars by using the engineering at this ethanol plant. Time to fire up the chemistry and biology parts of your brain. Come on, let's go. We'll kind of skip over this next little segment because we're going to go a little bit into the process. And yes, this is a very, very big, this is a very big uh, graphic with a lot of very, very little words. Don't worry, we're going to see this process carry itself out. But basically, we have to have a, what's called a feedstock. In this case, because we are in the Midwest, corn is our largest feedstock for making ethanol. You can make ethanol out of a lot of things. They make it out of sugar cane. They make it out of alfalfa. They make it out of grasses. In Brazil, they're making it out of, out of tree pulp. Pretty much anything that can be broken down into starches can become ethanol. It has to be broken down to the point of becoming a flour, where it's then blended with a variety of, of precursors that will allow it to be broken down into starches. We're going to add some water to it. We're going to get it warm. We don't have to get it a lot warm because it's going to do it's going to do its own thing. Then over time, we're going to put it under some pressure. We're going to get it to about 190 proof. At 190 proof, it's good alcohol for drinking. It's a little bit more pure and a little bit more proof or less proof or more proof than ever clear, but it's not quite good enough for cars yet. So we've got a little bit more to do along the way to do some evaporation and bring it along the way. We're also gonna produce a variety of byproducts that we can use in other places. You heard him talk a little bit about corn syrup. Well, one of the byproducts is corn oil. Corn syrup is a whole nother, a whole nother process. But again, corn oil, if you have Mazola or those kinds of things, but we actually use corn oil, distiller's corn oil, in a whole nother way that we're going to talk about when we get to biodiesel. So one bushel of corn, that bushel basket full of shelled corn, is going to give us about three gallons of ethanol. It's going to give us 15 pounds of distiller's grain animal feed at 10% moisture. It's going to give us about a, almost a pound of distiller's corn oil, and it's going to give us 16 pounds of carbon dioxide. Now you probably don't think much about carbon dioxide until you want to open up your soda and it doesn't fizz. A lot of the byproduct from ethanol is going into carbon dioxide, it's going into carbonators for people who make soda and beer. So a lot of it gets shipped. That's one of the things that most people don't know. There are people who are literally making ethanol specifically for the carbon dioxide content. So let's take a look at the process. I can get it back to the video here. Creates challenges that threaten national security as well as our economic stability. While ethanol alone can't solve all of these challenges, it does play an important part by helping to extend our fuel supply. Ethanol is an oxygen enhancing fuel additive produced by starch fermentation. With over 80 million acres of corn produced annually, this renewable energy source meets the needs of automobile manufacturers and the petroleum industry. Recognized for its cleaner burning characteristics, it also meets the demand for cleaner burning fuel additives mandated by the federal government, resulting in an industry production rate of over two and a half billion gallons annually. Welcome to Midwest Grain Processors, the flagship of the ethanol industry's new generation ethanol plants. A cornerstone in a field of opportunities industrial park, MGP benefits from the strategic location of farm direct top quality corn, Northern Borders natural gas pipeline, 
and rail distribution advantages from the Union Pacific Railroad. Cutting edge technology, coupled with one of the most productive growing regions in the world, equates to over 45 million gallons of denatured ethanol produced yearly, or enough fuel additive to send the average car for 11.25 billion miles. This type of volume requires 16 million bushel of corn, or a staggering approximate 50,000 bushel per day. All corn delivered to MGP undergoes quality monitoring by federally licensed independent grain inspectors. Maintaining control of inbound grain quality maximizes plant conversion efficiency and minimizes potential infections that are costly. Two grain dump pits with a capacity of 15,000 bushel per hour keep the corn flowing and ultimately distributed in these 200,000 bushel silos. This capacity provides MGP with a five to seven day supply in case of inclement weather. A state of the art control room and laboratory is the heart of the entire operation. A 24 hour control system monitors all processes and product flows. Laboratory personnel monitor the process for conversion of starch, production of alcohol, and quality of the end products. Corn is comprised of starch by weight at 65 to 70 percent, germ 6 to 7 percent, water between 14 and 16, and fiber at 10 to 12 percent. Corn is fed into a grinder called a hammer mill that provides a consistent smaller sized particle or flour that exposes the starch for processing. Liquid is then added to create a mash and the first step in the cooking process. The temperature is then increased to liquefy the starch in the mash while enzymes are added to break down the starch to long chain sugars and ultimately produce glucose. The mash is now cooled and transferred into large fermentation tanks where yeast is added to start the fermentation process and converts the sugars into alcohol. This process takes about 45 hours with the final stage set in the beer well. Carbon dioxide is a byproduct of yeast fermentation. A CO2 scrubber entrains the vapor alcohol in water and returns it to the process. The fermented mash is separated from the alcohol in the distillation and dehydration process. Water and spent solids are then removed for the purpose of purifying the alcohol to a sellable product. Alcohol is flashed or heated to 170 degrees in the first column or beer column where the vapor is captured at the top of the column while the solids are pumped from the bottom to a holding tank. The second column or rectifying column separates high proof alcohol from water as the alcohol is flashed again to a vapor at 170 degrees at the top and lower proof alcohol is pumped out the bottom to a side stripper. The side stripper separates low proof alcohol from extra water based again on the 170 degree flashpoint, while the water falling from the bottom is pumped back into the cook process for reuse. This process results in 190 proof or 95% alcohol, but there is still another step. The alcohol is then pressurized through a molecular sieve or series of beads that allow water to be absorbed. Because the alcohol molecules are too large to enter the sieve, 200 proof alcohol flows through to a tank ready to be denatured, loaded and shipped to a refinery or gasoline distribution hub for blending. The remaining water is recycled and used once again in the cook process. Efficient and cost effective transportation of the final product is key to MGP's premier status as a volume supplier that is able to meet the demands of the petroleum industry. A private fleet of leased tank cars gives MGP the ability to reach into any destination with cost-effective ethanol and is unsurpassed in the industry. Truck capabilities allow MGP to react to local demands for fuel ethanol as well. 
always ensuring that the best priced product makes it to the most needed destination. Spent grains from the remaining mash are processed in a centrifuge that condenses the solids into a wet cake with a moisture content of approximately 65%. Wet cake has high nutritional value in the livestock market, allowing for the product to be a source of protein as well as energy at feeding or nutritional values equal to or better than that of whole corn. During this process, the liquid or stillage that is removed from the spent grains is evaporated to remove the excess moisture. The thickening of the stillage produces a byproduct called syrup that contains 30 to 40 percent solids. This product is applied to the wet cake during the drying process, thus giving the byproduct name dried distiller's grains with solubles. The wet cake is then dried to a 10% moisture using large rotary drums to provide high quality dried distiller's grains with solubles, which are used in a variety of feed markets. Midwest Grain Processors is more than just an ethanol plant. The employees, members and management have positioned themselves to be a driving force Oh, we won't let you we won't let you see the rest of the propaganda of the company but um we're going to take a look at a place that i'm very familiar with this is just up the road from the town i used to live in this is the little town of shell rock iowa those of you who are heavy duty into short line railroads might have heard of the iowa northern which was basically built along a rock island um, secondary main line this sits right along that main line. Now this was, this was Flint Hills resources probably about 10 years ago. And as you can see, they are taking corn at a high rate of speed. They need about anywhere between 25 to 28 covered hoppers full of corn each day or about 100 truckloads. So they're not only, in this case, at this point in time, they're not only taking corn off of the farm and from local elevators, they're also loading and unloading covered hoppers. Now they've they've expanded this facility amazing, amazingly. This is a very, it's a big plant, but it's grown considerably. If you look at just the railroad side of it, the Iowa Northern now has an ethanol blending yard where they bring unit trains of ethanol cars from other sites and they actually sell unit trains out of this yard. If you look far, a little bit farther to the right, there's a single track, that is their main line. They also uh, mix and blend a variety of different feed products out of this facility as well. So they've actually grown with the company. The railroad has gotten more opportunities. And now they've built a built another place on the northern side of their of their terminal and on the southern terminal in Cedar Rapids, where they interchange with the Iowa Interstate, the UP, um, they interchange with the CN and Waterloo. They've got a lot of different outlets for this product. Obviously, we need to start with the load in and out because we got to get corn in and we have to get product out. The load in process in, in a lot of cases in Iowa is predominantly truckloads because farmers bring it in from their farms where they've stored, uh, elevators truck it in from their elevators. A lot of the branch lines that used to be out there for the railroad to ship in via covered hoppers aren't there anymore. So they'll, they'll work to get corn in any way they can. They still load unit trains and process unit trains in and out of these plants in a lot of cases but not as much as they used to. Now, if you wanna use corn and you're on the West Coast, you take corn unit trains or down South. And a lot of the unit trains that load at elevators here end up at ethanol either on the West Coast, East Coast, or down on the Gulf Coast. So corn that originates in Iowa may be made into ethanol. It may not be made into ethanol in Iowa or in Wisconsin or in the Dakotas. So. These, these cars are moving constantly. So load in and load out is, is done pretty much 24 seven. You heard them talk that they like to have a seven day amount of product on hand in storage. 
but they're constantly cycling that storage so they keep fresh product on hand. If the weather gets bad, if they have a derailment, if they have a rail service interruption, they can continue to produce ethanol. Well, it wouldn't be a it wouldn't be a good NMRA clinic if I didn't talk about modeling. And, and one of the reasons that I'm going to kind of show off a little bit of some of the stuff that's out there is there's a fair amount of product out there right now that we can help us model some of this ethanol industry. Now, we may not be able to build an entire plant, but we may be able to build someone who utilizes that alcohol. If you have a fuel terminal on your railroad, chances are pretty good if you had blending going on, you could blend ethanol. And you could get carloads of ethanol from my railroad that produces it, if we want to think along that. Walther's, a number of years ago, did their uh, ethanol plant series, where they produce not only um, the buildings that you would need to build a full ethanol plant, modeled after another Flint Hills Resources plant in Fairbank, Iowa. Um, and it's all, the, it's all the same buildings that you see pretty much on any ethanol plant, any place you would go in the country. You're going to have those same kinds of things. Here's our, here's what they refer to as the corn unloading building. Again, we're gonna we're gonna dump we're gonna dump trucks in there. We're gonna dump and load covered hoppers, and that's an important that's an important piece of the puzzle because we also load byproduct back out, and they have to be able to go both ways. So if they're not taking grain in, they're loading dried distillers grain back out. Now this is a pretty normal small plant. If we were gonna model one, this would be a place to start. Most of us don't have this kind of room on our layouts. It would be very, very difficult for us to say, gee, it would be great to have all that room and I'd really love to build one of these, but I don't think I've got that much room. How could we compress this a little bit? Well, you might get just a little bit of piece of the puzzle. Obviously, when we start, we're going to have to start producing some of that. This might be one of those things you compress. You might not need an energy center if you're not going to put the whole whole enchilada in. But this is the place where it starts. This is where the milled corn, after it's been unloaded and processed, goes into the energy center where water is added, the enzymes are added, and we start the process. They produce what they call the mash. And then the mash is pumped into the tanks that are behind it, which are the distillation tanks. Well, again, Walther's produced a wonderful model for this. You've got everything you would ever need there. You've got the beer, you've got the beer tanks on the back side of it. You've got the different fractionalization tanks on the front that we talked about that we used to separate. And then after the after it comes back out from the distillation tanks. We have the ability to separate and produce that high, high proof 190 and 200 proof alcohol. They produce distillation tanks for us. Very, very nice ones. Uh, I just finished building eight of them for a friend, and they're already they're already in the drying rack over by my airbrush. Um, they go together quite nicely. They look a lot like this when they're finished. This is this is Walther's particular picture. Um, um, a lot of times you will see them either in silver or white. Again, they don't want they want to they don't want them to take in a lot of heat from the sunlight. So they either use the silver, which gives it a reflective surface, or the white, so it doesn't ex so it doesn't absorb much. Um, I don't think I've seen them painted in any other colors. There again, they'll have a concrete base in most cases and they'll have all kinds of different structure. Again, there's all kinds of really nice gingerbread. This, these come from their, uh, their fermentation tank detail kit. This is a wonderful kit because it's got a lot of things you can use for other things. These are as rare as hen's teeth. Um, so are a lot of the uh, ethanol plant kits. Walther's hasn't produced them in a couple of years. I put in a call to Walther's two weeks ago, they haven't called me back as to when they're gonna do these again. I'm not sure they'll tell me when they're gonna do these again, but knowing that they're gonna do another run of the, uh, of the uh, ethanol tank cars, I'm guessing these buildings are somewhere in the food chain coming back out because they just brought the iron buildings 
which were the series in front of this one. So I think we're fairly close. So if we're going to model the plant, we're going to have to compress it a little bit. What I'm showing you is just a couple of ideas that I had that I threw together, one of which uh, is from a set of modules that we, we played around with and built, um, just to see how it, how it might work. The other one is something I threw together today that if you were going to, if you're going to draw something that's a little bit more model railroad like that I can put along my main line and still have a manageable, a manageable flow, what would that might look like? So the top, the top is something, and again, like I say, crudely drawn today, uh, just to get something in there to think about what you might do. Again, think about a, think about a spur off of a main line where you would have grain that would be dumped and dry distiller's grain, the first track off of the main line on the, towards the bottom. And then there are two other tracks that would probably be used, at least in my world, most likely for either loading tank cars, or they could be the dry distiller's grain as well. Again, I threw another spur up on top on the other side of the main line just to drop extra cars. Now, most of these plants have some sort of critter, an in-plant switcher. Some of them have a uh, have car movers, others have older switch engines. A couple of them I know have, have really, really nice SD9s or GP9s that have been rebuilt. They, they take great pride in them. They've actually been repainted. They're usually kept pretty clean. Um, they do a real nice job of keeping these things around. So just kind of ideas of thinking. You don't have to have the big space, but what if you did? What might you do? Well, again, I talked about that, can we sandwich it? Can we just have the sections with the grain bins up front and that unloading building and just enough tracks to put in a track for tank cars and a track for covered hoppers? Would be a very manageable plant. Could do it fairly easily, fairly routine. And that's kind of what I went with when I started drawing today, just a little bit, just to see what I could get away with. But sometimes we have odd spaces on our railroad. I, for one, have a section of my railroad that is in an odd place. For some reason, when they built my house, they gave me a five foot by what probably is a three foot outcropping where my utilities come in. And that happens to be where my water meter sits. Well, they don't read my water heater or my water meter inside anymore because they have a remote. So they don't have to have access to it unless they have to change the remote. So I'm thinking, what could I do back there? Well, then I found this nice little plant in Nebraska that sits out into a nice little area that could jut in. Now, yeah, I'm probably not going to, I'm probably not going to uncouple much inside of that thing unless I want to crawl under it, but I could probably get cars around to bend into it, grab them, couple them, pull them back out. It's a thought process. It's trying to decide, is there something that I could do? Again, maybe a corner along a wall where the, where the main line would go through a wall, and this might be a way to go up a partial wall or something that you could build another industry with. And then I say, you know, there's always something in model railroading to replicate from the prototype. We all built a looped 4 by 8 correct? This is the biodiesel plant in Jefferson, Iowa. It is a very typical loading and unloading facility. They get soybeans. They make biodiesel out of crushed soybeans and they make soybean oil out of it. And then they refine that along with precursors from the process of ethanol to make biodiesel. And when I kind of scaled this thing out, it fits on about a five foot by 10 foot looped board. And I thought, gee, that would be interesting. And you could operate it from one end. Now, most people aren't going to be excited enough by a model railroad that it's a one industry, one product town. But if you didn't have a lot of opportunity to switch and it was something you just wanted to try, build something fairly interesting, here's a possibility. Well, the world here, at least in my world, in a lot of cases, as I watch the BNSF go by right now with an intermodal train, 
as I look out my window, tends to be unit trains. We hear a lot about how modern modeling is very boring because all we have are unit trains. Well, I can honestly say the BNSF isn't quite that bad. I still get to see a fair amount of manifest traffic. But when ethanol and oil are moving, I see a lot of tank cars and endless strings of tank cars. Most of the ethanol that is produced moves by tank car. Now you're thinking, we have pipelines everywhere. Why don't we ship it by pipeline? Well, when I was talking to when I was talking to Perry earlier, he told me about the title being how it's bad for your two-stroke engine. Anybody know why ethanol is bad for your two-stroke engine? Because if you leave ethanol gas in your lawnmower over the winter, the ethanol likes to bond with water. It does the same thing in pipelines. And your nice 200 proof ethanol, by the time it gets down to wherever it's going to go in a pipeline, generally isn't 200 proof anymore. I'm not saying it isn't done, but it's not done very often. So a lot of this ethanol ships by rail. It may not come in as corn to start the process, but it will ship out generally by tank car. Yeah, there's some people in the Midwest that haul it by tank truck as well, but when you got to have a lot of ethanol for your uh, refinery or your tank farm, you're probably going to get it from tank cars. So we see long strings of these, these uh, ethanol trains and oil trains. And it's been that way for a long time. I talked about A.E. Staley. This picture is back from the 50s, late 50s, early 60s. And this guy is probably getting a pretty good contact high from sniffing the, uh, sniffing the alcohol, but he's got to make sure that he doesn't overflow the tank. Um, I don't even want to know. But Staley made all kinds of products. They made corn oil. They made corn ethanol. They made corn syrup. Pretty much anything that you can imagine Staley has made at one time. They are now part of the Tate and Lyle uh, conglomerate. They do an awful lot of, awful lot of product. Uh, you still see their uh, corn syrup cars in a lot of spaces. I know a lot of Coke bottlers and Pepsi bottlers get Tate and Lyle. And strangely enough, so do breweries. But chances are pretty good. We're, we're gonna, just going to load, we're going to load a tank car at a time. There may, be, there may be some structures where they're a bit bigger that they can load more. But this is a pretty standard ethanol loading facility. This one is from Badger State Ethanol in Monroe, Wisconsin, served by the Wisconsin and Southern. Um, and right now they aren't, they're not currently loading. They've got a car ready to load. Chances are pretty good their car mover is out, maybe pulling another car up back up. So they've got two that they can load when they're ready to go. You'll notice that there is a little blue pumping station and it's blue and you wonder why blue? Well, you heard about denaturing. When we ship ethanol, if we ship 200 proof ethanol, it's grain alcohol, folks. It's like heavy duty high test Everclear. You couldn't, couldn't drink very much, it would probably kill you. So they denature it, they put gasoline in it. Every ethanol plant gets two to three tank cars of gasoline a week where they blend just a little bit of gasoline in it to make it unpalatable. So this is what you see there is essentially a denaturing device that goes in as they load. They don't put the gasoline in it as they store it. The gas is stored separately, and then it's combined as they load. A little bit closer look at it. You'll notice that there are spill pads everywhere. The EPA is just as strong in the ethanol industry as they are in the petroleum industry. We don't like to spill. We don't want to spill. So obviously they want to make sure that they cat they get the catch. It also it also keeps water. Um, it keeps it from getting a little bit messy around the things. You'll notice that these are pretty well maintained facilities. That's nice. That's pretty nice uh, ballast in there. They're not going to mess with it much. Well, your first thing that you're going to do is you're going to take a look at some of the things that Walters can give us. The tank car loading rack is a really nice item, except for one minor problem. When Walthers built this, they didn't have 50-foot tank cars. They had 40-foot tank cars, so this rack 
will do 40 foot tank cars really, really nicely. But you can kit bash it. And I have. As a matter of fact, there's one up on my bench as well that's getting kit bashed. But it's a pretty nice starting point. A lot of a lot of places will load tank cars on either side. Here's an opportunity to run your loader right down the middle. But if you want something a little bit more modern, a little bit more high speed loading, they're going to make us those really, really nice high speed loaders complete with the hazmat catch pieces. So Walther's has done us a lot of favors. And the nice thing about this is they broke this out of one of their kits. This used to come in one of their tank kits as a second. So if you wanted more than one or two of them, you had to actually buy another tank kit. I know an awful lot of guys who have tank farms because they didn't need all the tanks for their ethanol plant to get as enough of these as they needed. Now these are available. These are still available and out there. But we need to haul it. And along the time that Walther's was building these buildings, they were producing an ethanol tank car and Atherin was producing an ethanol tank car. These are Trinity tank cars. They tend to be about 30,000 gallons. The 30,000 gallon car is designed for a little bit lighter commodity like gasoline, petroleum products, alcohol, because it doesn't weigh quite as much as syrups that would go in a much, much smaller car. The, the tear weight is different for the volatiles than it is for some of the, some of the sugar-based product. So these are a little bit bigger. You could get away with a little bit bigger if you were modeling an older era, you get away with a little bit older tank car, nicely in that 45 to 50 foot range as well. Walther's did a really nice one. Theirs has the, um, has the impact ends, what we call the DOT 111s. Those are designed so that when the car derails, the couplers and the drawbars don't get into the end of the tank quite as much so they don't puncture. Early on when they were shipping oil out of the Bakken fields and they'd have derailments, they'd have amazing fires. Uh, I've, I've been close enough to one to say that it's a pretty intense thing to see if you ever get the opportunity. They derailed one down by Galena, Illinois. And we were across the river on the Iowa side and you could feel the warmth. So they, they, did go, they do go up. Fortunately, there's only been one real major disaster. And if you know about the, Mon the Montreal, Maine and Atlantic, and you look that up, you'll know about the, um, the disaster that had with some of that oil. And then scale trains, our friends down in Tennessee, again, they built a Trinity tank car first, initially with the idea for the, for the oil trains that were moving, because that was a big product. But then they discovered that tank cars, when they started getting some of the pipelines and some of the Bakken oil was moving by pipeline more. A lot of those tank cars became available and a lot of the ethanol producers said, we like those. They're good cars. They're already up to DOT specs. Send them to us rather than storing them. So a lot of them ended up out, on the, uh, out in the uh, wilds of Iowa hauling ethanol. So we've done our distillation. We've done some of the things that go along with that distillation, but we made more from that corn than just ethanol. Let's talk about what that's going to look like. We'll skip you. Really interesting, but how does ethanol get into our gasoline plant and then into gas stations across the country? I have the slightest idea, but you know what? This guy might be able to help us out. I think I can help you figure this out. Critical questions. How does ethanol affect acting? What outlines affect our industries? I know I'm not working here yet, but I'm starting to get the hang of this. I think the ethanol has got to come through some of these pipes here and end up in these big guys back here. And you guys are, oh, jeez. It's not done yeah. there. Yeah, not quite. There's a couple more steps. From those big tanks, we'll load it into a rail car over there, and then it'll go to a, a terminal. And at the terminal, they'll put it in with gasoline. Told you. And a gasoline will be shipped to, gasoline with the ethanol will be shipped to 
the gas station where you would fill up your car? Let me guess. Ten percent ethanol. You get a gold star. You know, ten percent still sounds like a delusion to me. I'm going high octane when I get my first car. And you should because there's more horsepower in octane. And ethanol is a great octane booster. And what it does is it takes away some of the petroleum that would have the octane and it puts ethanol in its place. And then that is used in the chemical industry that can make plastics and other higher value products. Uh, time out. What's octane? Octane is something that they measure in gasoline to reduce knocking an engine. And ethanol by itself has about 113 octane, and gasoline that you blend it into has about 84 octane. Well, you need to get up to like 89 or 91 before you put it in the engine. So when you mix it together, it gives you the 91. Oh, so ethanol is what's going to supercharge my car when I get it. <laughs> That's cool of what's going into your car, but Aren't you more worried of what's coming out of it? And a higher performing or better performing car will reduce the emissions coming out of the car. So ethanol does help with the emissions of the car. So I'm going to look cool in my new car and be environmentally friendly. Gotta admit that it's pretty cool feeding those little yeasts corn mash to make ethanol. Maybe, but I'm still curious about something. I mean, think about it. Where does all of that leftover corn mash go? It has to go somewhere. Yeah, but that's why we have to discover the rest of the story. See Mount Everest over there? Let's check it out. That little Mount Everest, that's just a little bit of what we produce. So this product, the way we load it out of the plant, it's loaded out in two modes of transportation. First, by truck, semi-hopper truck. This truck product stays mostly in the domestic market fed to swine, poultry, and beef. The other mode of transportation is rail cars. We utilize the rail cars because we can ship the product faster and further. This product will get shipped to the river, the Mississippi River, to be offloaded onto barges. The barges then float down to the Mississippi to be loaded onto large Panamax vessels that are shipped to China, Japan, Asia. We also will ship rail cars into Chicago to offload the rail cars into containers that we ship to Southeast Asia, primarily Vietnam, Korea, Thailand. Again, all of this product is a very nutritious product for animal feed, high in protein, energy, and fiber. Whoa, so you really are helping feed the world. Yeah, but all of this is dry. Didn't we see mash earlier? How to get from that mushy goo to this dry stuff. We gotta get that dried down in order to transport it. In order to do that, we have to further process the mash to remove a lot of the water, and then we send it through two sets of dryers to dry it down into a 12% moisture product. No way, can we see it? Uh, yeah, we can see it, but it's really hot, so we're gonna make it a quick trip. It's sweet. See, the amazing corn kernel not only helps to power our vehicles, it also helps to feed the world. That's a twofer. Two different uses from the same thing. Making ethanol and feeding livestock and other animals. I guess we're done with this assignment. Hang on, guys. There's another product that we produce from the corn kernel. It's called distiller's corn oil. What? I thought we were done here. Mission Control, what's going on? Well, that's a wrap for you guys in Iowa. But Team B is heading to Beatrice, Nebraska to find out how they use distiller's corn oil to make another type of biofuel. So let's talk about, let's talk about byproducts for a second. We saw the centrifugal dryers, and one of the things that got me very interested in this, in this process at first was I went by this, this plant that I'd never seen before on the interstate and I saw these rather amazing pieces of heavy duty structural steel, like you would see in a, in a metal plant for, as a blast furnace. And these are called ring dryers. And this is the more efficient way of doing, the, the drum dryers work pretty well, but these can actually dry it faster, quicker, and with less energy by cycling all of that fiber up through this ring as hot air is flowing through it. 
And it's a pretty interesting process to, to hear it described. Obviously, you can't see it because it's all enclosed. And again, it's very, very warm. But these plants, as you can see by the stack, produce a surprisingly large amount of steam when they are fully engaged in the winter time. But dried distiller is great. It's a huge product being shipped practically everywhere. Um, as I see some of the pictures you guys put out online, I've seen some pictures from um, Folkestone, Georgia of green Inco Braza Industries cars, four bay covered hopper cars going by. And those Inco Braza cars are filled with dried distiller's grain. Where are they going? Chicken producers. Tyson loves these guys because they produce all kinds of great product for them. Literally the cattle industry exists on dried distiller's grain and different formulations of dried distiller's grain. Again, it's loaded in covered hoppers, usually four bay because it's lighter. It's not as heavy as corn is. We've taken the water weight out of it. We've taken some of the, some of the starch out of it. We can ship it in a little bit bigger car. So you see it in four bay covered hoppers. And again, it's loaded exactly like you would think from the top. In the same bays that they load the trucks, they're paved, literally, the covered hoppers are being loaded there. I have literally seen a covered hopper backed up to a trailer that they were loading. One end was getting, getting DDG. The truck hopper was getting DDG from another spout. Same game. If these guys don't, don't spend any more money than they have to to get it shipped. And again, Walters gave us a really, really nice building, the processing center. They even gave us this nice little very small portion. You can kind of see the little spout sticking out there where you would dry the grain in the open air and a place where a payloader could go in there, a four-wheeled loader can go in there, scoop the grain up and put it into a hopper or a grain truck to be able to be shipped out. It's a little bit small for most purposes, but this is model roading we selectively compress. We got to ship it too. Now you may think I'm, I'm holding up ADM here, but Walther's has made these cars in so many different road names. It happened to be that Walther's and the Atlas car that I pulled down of those four bay covered hoppers just happened to be ADMs. So don't think I'm saying they're the only guys that do it. ADM is a big ethanol producer as well. Now there's another product. You heard him talk a little bit about shipping the product quickly to consumers because it was wet. Well, the wet distiller's grain product is a very, very, very viable product for a lot of industries, particularly cattle feeders. The problem is this stuff as it dries out becomes hard as concrete. And so they try to keep it intact and keep it wet to ship it. Now there are only a couple of, couple of plants that are doing this. It's a Cargill product, they call it Sweet Brand. So you're only getting it out of Cargill providers. It goes specifically to feedlots in Texas along the BNSF and the UP. Dalhart, Bovina, and um, Amarillo are the two, three that, I, that I'm aware of. It goes in old aluminum coal hoppers because again, they don't want it, they don't want air to get it because the second air gets at it, it starts to, it starts to harden. They also want to be able to rotary dump it, but they have to cover it. When I first started seeing these cars, they were covering them with blue tarps. Now they've got these really, really nice roller tops. And it goes to feed cows. Your steak probably came out of one of these feedlots. If you've ever gone between Kansas and New Mexico along Highway 54, there's about 120 miles of continuous feedlot. The smell is amazing. That's all I'm going to say. And then a little bit further on this highway are every company's packing plant known to man. Literally, it is a big conveyor belt. Feed in, cattle fed, beef out. This is, um, this is the Cargill facility in Bovina. It is a big loop. They are hauling in right now a unit train load of these uh, rotary hoppers. And they're also dried distiller's grain hoppers. You also notice there's some tank cars 
they have some of that distiller's oil and distiller's syrup that they add to the feed to enhance it. It's a typical feed mill. A smaller feed mill uses the same product, they just don't use as much of it. So if you're modeling and you have a feed mill, you might think about some dried distiller's grain cars, some tank cars from an ethanol plant, and the possibility of maybe some, some wet, wet DDG cars. Always the possibility to model more. And let's go. And this is how they dump it. It's just like a, if you ever have ever gone to a coal plant and seen a rotary car dumped, they roll the, uh, they roll the uh, covers off and they literally turn the car. This is an interesting set of video. This came from the New York Times. The New York, New York Times did a three-day feature on cow flatulence because they were worried that that's, that's a thing that's going to take care of the, uh, take care of our uh, ozone layer. Well, it probably does. There's a fair amount of it over, over New Mexico, but I don't think it's the only thing that's gonna cause us to have problems by any stretch. Oh, I goofed. So there are a couple of people providing these too. My, one of my friends at MacRail, Greg McComas, some of you may know that he's produced a lot of different kinds of things in 3D printing. Uh, he has some really gorgeous uh, end of train devices available. Uh, he's also done all kinds of car covers, ballast doors, you name it, he's probably producing it in some way, shape or form. This was his first test shot. I have to tell you, this is not the end product because it sits a little bit too high. He missed on the, uh, he missed on the, uh, on the, uh, measurements a little bit so it doesn't fit down into the car. Uh, a new one is being produced as we speak. And this is the proto loads version. So you have these available out there. So if you're modeling modern and you want to do a kind of unique unit train, just say that you have a cattle feeder that uses this nice little wet distiller's grain product. You wouldn't need very much of it. So we talked a little, we've talked about ethanol, but the, the uh, stepchild, if you will, of the process of ethanol is biodiesel. And biodiesel is becoming even a bigger product than ethanol probably will be, because you can produce a product that is 100% in its whole part available to fuel vehicles. There was a gentleman down in Iowa City, Iowa, that ran his diesel Volkswagen Rabbit entirely off of French fry oil, which is basically nothing more than biodiesel. Had a really interesting odor. So let's talk a little bit about waste oils and some of the product. And we'll skip ahead with the distiller's grain for animal feed. Plus, we still got this stuff left. And they're supposed to turn that into high quality biodiesel fuel. That's gotta be tricky. No tricks, just serious science and technology. That's what we're supposed to discover here. Critical questions. What waste products can make biodiesel? What is the recycling angle? We've just got to figure out how they get this stuff into biodiesel. So what's our first step? So we use that corn oil as a feedstock to, to make biodiesel that goes in diesel engines, much like this truck here. What's so special about biodiesel? You know, biodiesel is a renewable fuel. It's made from vegetable oils and other things like used cooking oil. So it's a renewable fuel. And the other thing about it is it improves lubricity in the diesel engines, as well as reduces greenhouse gas emissions. You know, David, it sounds like a really long and complicated process to turn this stuff into biodiesel. Is it even worth your time and energy? Actually, it is. You know, biodiesel produces very similar energy to that of traditional diesel. So is that the only benefit to making biodiesel here? Like, what about recycling? We recycle corn oil from an ethanol plant into a feedstock to make biodiesel. Where do you start? What's our first step? Well, let's head into the plant. We'll start off with feedstocks. So we made it to the lab to find out what other ingredients they use to make biodiesel. Well, they probably use more than just this. 
that's the finished product. Yeah, that's the product that comes out of the end of the plant when we're done making biodiesel. So here, hold that up next to it for a second. So you can see the difference of what goes in and what comes out. Wow. Well, what other things do you use to make that crystal clear biodiesel? This is used cooking oil. When you go to the fast food restaurant, this is what would come out of the French fry fryer when you're, after they've made your fries. Wait, so are you telling me there's French fries in there? Uh, not French fries in it, but it's the oil that came from making the French fries. And this is brown grease. This is just like that used cooking oil, except a, another plant has taken the best part of the, the best, highest quality oil off, and this is what's left. Looks like chocolate, right? But we can make biodiesel out of it. And this is tallow. Animal tallow? Tallow is from uh, hamburgers out of cows. That's the oil that's left over. Where do you get this oil? Does it just come from one place or like? All over the place. There's lots of different plants that collect these types of used cooking oils from all kinds of fast food restaurants and then sell it to us. We can use any of this at this plant to make biodiesel. That's what makes this plant so unique. Oh, I get it. So it's recycling. All of these jars are used to make... Sorry to interrupt you guys chewing the fat, but I've got incoming feeds from students wanting to know about the innovations and technology behind all this. Can't you get to that part? We're running a little low on time. Sure thing, mission controlling. Hey, I heard that. You're the ones having fun while I'm stuck here with the pigeons keeping the show going. So we just got back from the lab where we learned about all the different types of feedstock that they use in making biodiesel. Well, I still don't understand how they turn this into biodiesel. It's actually quite simple. The first part of the process is to remove all of the impurities in the feedstock. So you saw some of the other feedstocks in the lab that we have. So our first step of the process is to remove those impurities so we can actually get a cleaner oil to make fuel out of. So after impurities are removed from the oil, we mix oil and methanol and heat it up. And then we send it to our process. Our process is unique because we've combined two reactions into one reactor. There are multiple components in the feedstock that we want to turn into biodiesel. Our reactors have catalysts in them that when you mix the feedstock with methanol and run it over the catalyst, it will turn both of those components into biodiesel. The oil and methanol that are already hot meet on the surface of that catalyst. And then our reactions happen, transesterification and esterification. And we do all of that in one step, which makes our plant more cost efficient and more energy efficient. A traditional plant would use multiple pieces of equipment for it, where we only do it with one. What about the stuff that's left over from this process? Oh, you mean the co-products? Sure. Well, I can tell you about them, but I think it'd be a lot more fun to go see. Whoa, now we got to slow down the flow of technology. Ease up, you guys. My head's spinning and all the flow modulators are overheating. So we have one more. Mac Brown takes leftover food, puts it in his car, and converts it into fuel. Well, it looks like the future is here right now, as these scientists and engineers are taking garbage and food waste and turning it into real biodiesel fuel. And that technology they're using is paving the way into the future of biofuels. Oops, time to get back to all that technology. Critical questions. What reactions produce biodiesel? Where does glycerol come from? So this is the final step to the biodiesel production process. It's called the vacuum distillation unit. In the vacuum distillation unit, we remove all of the material that we didn't convert to biodiesel. So the pressure inside of that column is actually much less than what we're feeling right now on the outside. It's actually just barely above what you would feel in outer space. So our reaction mixture goes in as a liquid and gets vaporized inside the column. And the impurities go to the bottom and the biodiesel goes out to the top. This is one of the main reasons why our biodiesel is so clear. Why is the vacuum important in this process? Well, the vacuum is important because it actually lowers the boiling point 
of the liquid. Why lower the boiling point? We want to lower the boiling point because we want the liquid to boil before we actually degrade it by applying too much heat. You mentioned the co-products of this process. Anything else that comes out? So actually, when we create biodiesel out of fats, a co-product of that is glycerin. And glycerin is separated. It's actually a liquid, liquid separation. So what we do is we take our reaction mixture, slow it down, and it will, the glycerin will separate itself. It will move to the bottom of the tank, and the biodiesel and mixture will move to the top. So what we can do is just drain the glycerin out of the bottom and push the biodiesel out of the top, and that's how we get that separation. So glycerin can either be used by itself or it can be turned into different products. So one example of it being used by itself is uh, in toothpaste. The sweetener in toothpaste is glycerol, which is a component to our glycerin. So we started out with all of these feedstocks, including this distiller's corn oil and this dirty cooking grease. And after we removed all the impurities that make up the co-products of this plant, we got biodiesel. And there you have it, the complete story. Yeah, we're not done yet. We still have to find out how they get that fuel into those diesel vehicles that transport people and products all around the country. Once we produce biodiesel, we store it in tanks, much like this tank here. And from those tanks, then we, we test it to make sure it meets our quality specifications. And it has to meet those before we can ship it. And once it meets those specifications, we load it in tank cars and rail cars and, and ship it out. Well, how does it get there? We make a lot of biodiesel here, so it is pumped through pumps and piping right across over our heads here into this loadout building, and then it's loaded onto the tanker or the rail car. Then what? From here, it leaves our site, and it goes to a blending terminal where it's blended with traditional diesel. Does it have to be blended, or can you just use it by itself? You know, biodiesel could be used to uh, fuel an engine by itself. However, it doesn't do so well at low temperatures, so for those reasons, we, we blend it. Another added benefit is less sulfur and better emissions for our vehicles. So that's good for the environment. So really, we've taken this pool of corn full circle. Now you've learned the complete story of everything that goes on in that biodiesel production plant. And you know, all this talk of feedstock has really made me pretty hungry. And look, fries that have been cooked in oil and that could be turned into biodiesel. Yeah, you decoded the science all right, but you forgot one critical ingredient. Well, we won't we won't let him talk too much about the one critical ingredient because it's getting we're getting a little bit long. Um, I always throw this one in because no matter how much we plan, no matter how much we build, we always we always get to see some interesting things along the way, and. The biodiesel story is one I'm not really ready to totally tell yet about how to build the plants. I have some ideas. The good news is a lot of modeling is going on that's helping us do that. Um, there are a bunch of guys in the 3D printing industry that are working towards doing some of the structures. Yeah, we can do it and we can definitely do it in Plastistruct and do all, all kinds of things, but sometimes there are moldings and different kinds of things that don't aren't as easy to execute as they could be on a 3D printer. So as I tell people for biodiesel, stay tuned. I think the models are going to be coming. And again, that product is shipped 100% with tank cars. In a lot of cases, they're shipping it and getting it to places where they blend it. Pretty much every mass transit system in the country right now is using biodiesel in some way, shape, or form. The BNSF is committed to blended biodiesel in a lot of their, a lot of their diesels and facilities, particularly in places where air quality is a very, very important thing to the people of, that they uh, spend time with. So from that one little kernel of corn, started in springtime last year, probably today is powering a wide variety of different products, things you don't even think about from the Coca-Cola you might be drinking to the toothpaste you brushed your teeth with this morning to the steak you're going to have when we get done with this uh, presentation. So pretty much everything along the way. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. And I'll take questions if you'd like me to here. As soon as I escape my way out of here. There we go. 
Oh, let me unmute people. Sorry about that. That's okay. I'll try and okay. answer them. If I can't answer them, like I say, I'm a I'm a geek, but I'm not a I'm definitely not a chemist. <laughs> so okay, so people who would like to unmute themselves can, and there there have been a couple of comments in the chats. Um, fermenters, the Walters card needs double, probably double shelf couplers, and um, yes, this presentation was recorded. So if you if you want to go back and look at another part of it at some point, it will be on mm -hmm. the Piedmont Division um, YouTube channel eh, sometime soon. Yeah, Jerry, thank you for the fermenters. I always call, yeah. call them distillation tanks, but they are fermenters. You are correct. Yeah. And actually, if you have any questions, I designed a whole bunch of the plants. I've worked for ICM. I did consulting work. I oh, cool. The, the Verisun plants and um, probably about 75 different plants in the Midwest. So some in California, some over in Thailand. So whole bunch of different I was going to say, and, did and you do the Vera Sun plant? Yeah, I did the one up say, in... Um, did you do the Vera Sun plant in Carroll City? <laughs> no, the one in... Um, well, I mean, they, they bought several from us, but the one up in yeah. uh, Brookings, uh, the 300 million... Well, it, it's three 100 million gallon uh, plants, so... And Just a little and a whole bunch of biodiesel, too, so... Uh, <laughs> Fun and games with chemical engineering. Hey, Dave. Amazing process. There's a, uh, over there in Aiken, South Carolina, down there, that little, the Greenville's, so Greenville Northern or whatever, they they run a, uh, there's an ethanol plant over there. They move out the trains and the interchange with CSX down there in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. They run a pretty good long train out of there. Yep. We see a lot of we see a lot of product get interchanged to NS and CS up here. Um, I know the CP is running trains to the NS and the CSX in Chicago that go down your way. I know the BNSF does as well. When I was doing the research, I wanted to see, gee, is there a plant in Georgia? And there was. Yeah, there Pelham. Yeah. A lot. Uh, it, has, it has recently closed to produce ethanol. They are making it a blending facility where it will continue to get unit trains. Another issue why it goes by trains is because uh, most of the pipelines are carbon steel and uh, it will rust the carbon steel underground pipelines. Mm -hmm. So they'll use stainless cars. Yeah, that's, that's another reason that people were a little worried about the Keystone pipeline because the the, the shale oil, the tar sands oil that's coming down from Canada is pretty abrasive, from what I understand, corrosive. So I think we'll see more of it in tank cars. Yeah, I was the one that made the statement about the shelf couplers. Uh, the manufacturers don't always tend to put the correct couplers with the type of car yes. it is, but um, they 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 did get the uh, crash the uh, crash plates in, but the uh, it's an easy mm -hmm. fix to go back and put the correct couplers on. So they're they're slowly but surely getting a little bit closer on a lot of that. So. Yeah, and I, I believe uh, all uh, tank cars on the road now have to have the shelf couplers. I yeah, all the real tank cars do. The but the modeling companies are not catching on. Right. As, uh they're just putting in their standard shelf, their regular standard couplers in. So a little detail they kind of forget about. So. Fortunately, the only thing my tank cars when they go on the ground bleed is money because they're probably knocking off a detail or something. Yeah, I try to leave them in the boxes till I'm ready because they don't take much to knock them off. So oh, nice we run cars, them. We run, we run them pretty hard here. So okay. Does anyone else there? have questions? No. Okay, well, I guess um, that does it then, if there are no more questions. I want to thank you, Dave, for doing your presentation tonight. That was really nice. I do, too. Well, thank you. It's always fun, it's always fun to, to show a little bit about what's going on. Um, I'm lucky in a lot of ways that I get to look out my window and watch the prototype, and it's easy to, it's easy to model stuff. So. Nice. And, 
Normally about this time, we'll see a dried distiller's grain train fly by, but it hasn't gotten here yet. So must be something going on up north that I don't know about yet. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, like I said, thank you very much. And uh, I hope to see you again on another clinic sometime soon. <laughs> you never know. Yeah, never know. All I right. gotta, okay. I'm, I'm hitting a couple of your members up for clinics too. I know I've talked to Perry and Tom Klamowski is mm -hmm. actually one of my, uh, my 3D printing guru hit him up today. So we're going to have nice. him on in a couple of weeks. So. Okay. Very good. Well, the thank you very much. Yes. Thank yes, you. Very thank much. you, Dave. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Most welcome. Anytime. All right. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.